questions without notice. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr. President, my question is directed to Senator Evans, the leader of the government of the Senate. Former Labor Deputy Premier Parker was jailed for taking money from his electorate campaign fund and using it for private purposes. How does that differ from Labor Party officials taking money from the central campaign fund and using it to pay off candidates' gambling debts and to provide holidays for candidates' families? Isn't such a payment a gross breach of trust to party donors who believe their contributions will go to legitimate campaign needs? And wouldn't such conduct demonstrate a seriously deficient sense of public morality on the part of such Labor Party officials? The Leader of the Government and the Senate, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. President, for a start, the matters to which Senator Hill is referring obviously have to do with state candidates and state elections and nothing to do with the operation of uh, Commonwealth elections or Commonwealth electoral law, even if the funding in question that's referred to uh, had related to a Commonwealth election. It wouldn't have had to be disclosed under the provisions of the Commonwealth Electoral Act as they stood uh, at the time of um, Premier Burke's administration. It wasn't until 1992 that the Act was amended to require uh, third parties to disclose gifts made to candidates or parties, which uh, would clearly have uh, brought this sort of situation to light earlier on, had that been the case. The further point to be made about the uh, particular case, however, of uh, Mr Smith is that um, circumstances, as I'm aware of them, or as I've been advised of them, are manifestly uh, very different in the sense that the, uh, the transaction between the party and the candidate was uh, completely uh, open and straightforward, at least as between them. It did involve uh, proper documentation and it did involve um, a very firm commitment for the funds in question being repaid. The basis of the uh, agreement was to ensure that a candidate who was in deep financial trouble didn't have to resign his parliamentary seat. Uh, the money was advanced to him to resolve his pressing financial problem. There was a written agreement that he'd repay the loan at commercial interest plus one per cent when he could, or at the latest upon his retirement and the receipt of his considerable superannuation payout. It was authorised by the appropriate party officers, and the transaction was won under the circumstance. Uh, which, under the circumstances, as I'm advised, uh, which manifestly didn't operate as a disbenefit to either the, uh, the party, uh, nor could it um, have operated uh, as a disbenefit uh, to any donor to the party from which the money was derived, because obviously it was to be repaid and on a commercially appropriate basis. So I don't have to say, I don't have to say any of that, because it's all to do with state politics and all to do with uh, state electoral law and state uh, party administration. But I put the matters on the record, because I think it is important to, uh, to put the matter in context. Supplementary, Senator um, Hill. Mr. President, um, what we're seeking to explore are the, the moral standards of Labor Party officials and where this and where this federal Labor Party government stands in relation to those issues. And it's got nothing to do with Mr. Smith, because Senator Chris Evans last night told us that Senator Behan's comments didn't relate to Mr. Smith. What we're talking about are statements saying that uh, that uh, campaign funds will be used to pay off candidates' gambling debts, not alone, pay off candidates' gambling debts, and for holidays of candidates' families. And what I asked you, Minister, was, isn't if, isn't if money is expended in that way, isn't it a gross Order. breach of trust, a gross breach of trust to the party donors who expected the money to be used for legitimate campaign ends? And wouldn't such conduct demonstrate a seriously deficient sense of public morality on the part of the Labor Party official Order. concerned. Senator Evans. Well, the Out of Capricornia, can I, uh, can Order. I, on my right. I hope Hansard has been taking down all those interjections because I want them incorporated passing in, uh, in the record, if that's, uh, if that's possible. Um, it is the case, as Senator McMullen has been saying more noisily than most, that people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. There's a long litany. There is a long litany of matters on the record or well known in political circles to be, uh, to be the case, so far as your side of politics is concerned, involving a whole variety of major corporate donors dealing in ways that I don't think you would be very keen to have exposed to the light of the day, but which I'll be perfectly happy to put on the record if you persist with this uh, approach. I've explained as best I can, to the best of my knowledge, the circumstance of the one particular matter that I am aware of so far as West Australia is concerned. I'm not aware of any other transactions that may have occurred. They're entirely speculative, hypothetical, or the subject simply of gossip or rumour. They're, they're not things about which I have any hard information at all. 
What I do know about, among other things, is the way in which some people on Minister's your side of politics have conspicuously expired. misused uh, taxpayers' Minister's funds. Minister's time has expired. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Security, Senator Crowley. What will be the role of Social Security in the provision of new assistance measures for farmers, farming families affected by severe drought, and how soon can families expect to this, receive this assistance? The Minister representing the Minister for Social Security, Senator Crowley. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I particularly appreciate getting this question, and it's also very appropriate. It comes from Senator West, whose um, commitment to people in rural Australia is very well known. The, um, under this initiative, Mr. President, families affected by exceptional drought will be eligible for new drought relief payments. The payments will be equivalent to job search allowance, with an automatic flow on to eligibility for family payments. Aus study will also be extended. It means, Mr. President, that a family with two children aged between 13 and 15 uh, will be able to receive about $380 per week. This payment will not be subject to any assets test on the farm. The usual income test for job search allowance and off-farm assets test will apply to ensure that the payment is directed to families in need. There will be no activity test, in the, there will be no activity test on the payment. I'll come to that, Senator. Farmers will not have to put their properties on the market and they will not have to be rejected for commer by commercial sources of finance. The payment will be available to farmers subject to the Exceptional Circumstances Declaration by the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. And that definition of exceptional circumstances, Senator, will apply uniformly across Australia. The first payment will be made on October 10 and it will be able to be backdated to October 1 this year. The payment will continue for six months after the cessation of this declaration. The payment is part of a comprehensive um, package of assistance measures announced yesterday. It is estimated that farm families will receive a total of about $48 million this financial year and a further $21 million next financial year. If the drought breaks in autumn under the drought relief payment, that should see the payment uh, assessed at about $21 million for next year. But if the drought persists beyond that, then a further $58 million is expected to be spent next financial year. These figures could increase, Mr. President, if there are further exceptional circumstances declarations. The payments will be legislated and will be available for as long as necessary and in any future exceptional droughts. This initiative represents a major commitment by the government and a recognition of the legitimacy of the farm sector's argument that a targeted welfare response is necessary. The response is highly targeted to those in need as a result of severe drought. And I acknowledge, Mr President, the um, good news was accepted very favourably by a number of the senators opposite who spoke during it last, yesterday in the, yesterday's adjournment, appreciating very much the, um, the package of this payment. And in particular, I think the recognition that payments to families are a critical part of the assistance. This is not just uh, ignoring the plight of the, the people out there. It is recognising very much that payments targeted to those families will have a very significant contribution to assistance during these exceptionally hard times. The package builds Mr. President, on the government's commitments to supporting families, particularly in need and particularly during this International Year of the Family. Senator Olson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is directed to you. Last night, uh, Senator Chris Evans uh, told the Senate that uh, Mr David Smith was not the person referred to in your evidence at the Parker trial as the recipient of campaign funds for gambling debts. If this is true, who was the candidate that received campaign funds for personal purposes? How many other candidates benefited in a similar manner during your tenure as party secretary? How much money was involved? For what purposes were these funds used? And on what grounds was it decided that these funds could be used for anything other than campaign purposes? Point, point of order, Senator Ray. I mean, it pains me to take the point of order because it's directed directly at you, Mr. Chairman, and you thereby have to rule on it. But whatever uh, duties you performed or activities you had as State Secretary of Western Australia eight or nine years ago have no relevance to question time here whatsoever in your role as president. And that's the only, only questions you can be asked as, as your role of uh, president. Um, I know by raising the point of order it puts you in an awkward position having to, to rule on yourself, but I mean, had anyone else been in the same position, I would have taken the same point of order. Well, on the point of order, Senator Olson. Uh, I, I, I also acknowledge that you have uh, some slight difficulty in adjudicating upon a matter to which you clearly have uh, an acute interest, 
But the fact is that this question relates directly to evidence given by you when you were the holder of very high office. We are not talking about actions of yours in the past. Actions of yours are simply a party functionary. We're talking about actions, very public actions of yours, in giving evidence in a criminal trial. Those actions di bear directly upon your current conduct and holding of high office. And I ask you in that capacity. Order, Senator McMullen. Speak to the point of order. Point of How order. can the same person stand in this parliament and say Easy. that to comment upon the cu current policy of the opposition is out of order, but to comment on the political party activities of the opposition of the government five years ago is in order? It takes to breathtaking proportions, to breathtaking proportions, the capacity to say two different things with a straight face and pretend you mean them both. Richard can do it. Order. The, uh, the point of order raised by Senator Ray is, of course, correct. Um, and the second point I'd like to make is that the, the questions such as this and the answers that flow from such questions could well be sub judice since several other charges have been levelled against David Parker, the person to whom you refer. But having said that, I, I do welcome this opportunity to put the record straight on what I think has been some terrible misreporting of, uh, of these events. I did agree to give evidence at, uh, at Mr Parker's trial. I gave evidence firstly as a character witness and secondly to comment in general terms on some of the problems faced by political parties in campaign fundraising. I was not asked nor did I comment on any specific matters relating to Mr Parker's trial nor was I aware except through newspaper reports since that time of the matters raised in that trial. In my comments on the use of campaign funds, I made two broad points, and these points were consistent with the points that I put to the Royal Commission prior to this. I made the point that the question of ownership of campaign funds has been a vexed and difficult one, since donations are frequently given to individuals rather than to the party, and since the intention of the donor is frequently not known. <coughs> this is a problem. I made the point also. Order. I made the point also that this is a problem that's, uh, that's experienced worldwide, and I gave some examples of uh, recent problems that they've had in America on this very thing. And as I said, this was consistent with evidence I'd previously given to the Royal Commission. I made the second point that in expending campaign funds, it's recognised that a wide discretion exists. Campaign expenditure sometimes involves judgments about whether certain things, which may not appear to be directly related to campaigning, our legitimate campaign expenditure. I indicated in relation to this that campaign funds had been expended on tidying up the image of a candidate. I believe that that is justified uh, use of campaign funds. And I indicated also under questioning that I had heard of a candidate who had had a gambling debt met by uh, what I thought was a campaign fund that later proved to be party funds in a, in a properly uh, arranged loan. At no time again did I refer to specific matters relating to Mr Parker's trial. I also made it clear that funds under my direct control while I was State Secretary from 1981 to 1987 were held under very tight control with complete probity and to strict accounting standards. All of those accounts have been examined by the Royal Commission and they have found nothing wrong with any of them. All of the accounts of the party over the period which I was there, I have no reason to believe that that's been any different since that time. And I made the point that uh, the instructions that were given to other funds, such as the Leaders Fund and local funds, were that they should be run on the, with the same standards and that under no circumstances should favours be given in return for donations received. As a result of the Royal Commission, the party's procedures have been tightened up, order and codes of conduct have been adopted by all states and nationally. And of course, disclosure legislation introduced in this parliament in 1991 now applies to all donations, state and federal. It didn't at that time. I've always been a strong advocate of disclosure, and I've also been an advocate of public funding, which I think is the only answer to this sort of problem long term. I've made a private submission to the Royal Commission to this effect. I did not condone the misuse of some funds that were not under my control during my term of office. I was simply trying in my evidence to convey some of the complexities of political fundraising and the expenditure that arises from that. 
supplementary question. Supplementary, Mr. Senator Austin. Well, I welcome uh, that uh, additional material that is now before the Senate. Uh, do I understand it from your uh, remarks that when you went beyond giving character evidence for uh, Mr Parker, you were in fact talking about party practices in such a way that you certainly didn't dissociate yourself from them or disapprove of them? I therefore ask you, uh, on what basis do you say that uh, it is a vexed question when funds are paid, when funds are paid into a campaign account as Order. opposed to a personal account? When you say the intentions of donors are often not known, what attempts were made during your reign to ascertain the intention of donors before the monies were given? On what basis, on what basis do you now say that uh, the code of conduct has been introduced, if it wasn't to improve practices which were clearly inadequate? And did, do I understand you to say? Do I understand? I understand your embarrassment. I understand your sensitivity. Do you now say? Do you now say that you dissociate yourself? From the sort of practices which you were quite happy to elaborate upon at uh, Parker's trial, or do you still take order, the view on a, on a that anything order, in the interest Senator of the party is just you, On a point of order, Mr. President, you're not obliged to expose yourself to this kind of second rate magistrate's court cross examination. You, under the standing orders, under the standing orders, you have no obligation whatsoever to respond to questions other than squarely to do with your administration of the presidency of this Senate. You chose to take the opportunity of an earlier question, which was manifestly out of order, to set the record straight. You have done so with dignity and in considerable detail. There is no obligation on you whatsoever to respond further, and I suggest that you do not do so. All I can say is that I have said all that I was going to say in that statement. Um, Senator Childs. Mr President, my question is directed to the Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. I understand that a meeting of the Cairns Group representatives was held this week in Washington to discuss prospective developments in the United States agricultural trade policy. Will the Minister inform the Senate of the outcome of the meeting and any follow-up that is planned? The Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. Thank you, Mr President. It is a great pleasure to have the opportunity to take the Senate back to matters of national interest. And this is profoundly in the interest of the nation and can, has the capacity to make a contribution to, as, and has the capacity Order. to substantially improve the living standards of many people, many of whom the National Party purports to represent. And I'd have thought they'd be interested and not welcome the interjections because they may wish to know. The Cairns Group seminar. Uh, there was a seminar of Cairns Group countries held in Washington on Tuesday this week. It was inaugurated during the meeting over which I presided in May and organised by the Australian uh, Embassy in Washington. It was attended by ambassadors from the 14 Cairns Group countries. They came together for two reasons. The first of which, and that which I want to give most emphasis to today, is to continue the pressure for implementation of the agriculture of the uh, Uruguay round decisions and secondly to maintain the pressure for agricultural trade reform which was initiated by the Uruguay round the major preoccupation of the seminar was getting the Uruguay round ratified and implemented by the US Congress and I thought we'd all have shared that priority so the Cairns Group ambassadors agreed to step up collective pressure on the United States administration and the Congress, because of course the administration is trying to get the legislation through. It's Congress that's causing the difficulty to pass the legislation in time to allow the uh, agreement to enter into force on the 1st of January 1995 and the benefits to start to flow accordingly. This action will serve to reinforce the message which I reported to the Senate earlier. The Washington representatives of the Cairns Group agreed to write a joint letter this week signed by all 14 ambassadors or their representatives to key congressional committee leaders. The message they will deliver is that it's critical, to the launching, uh, it's critical that they pass their legislation so that the World Trade Organization and the agreement it's designed to implement can commence on 1 January 1995. That, it's, that the United States must faithfully honour the commitments it's made and particularly on agriculture in the Uruguay round, and that it would be unacceptable for the United States to turn its export subsidy practices into general market expansion and trade development programs. The Cairns Group participants, of which Australia is one, are concerned that such proposals have been put forward in the context of the draft Uruguay round legislation. In addition to that letter, the ambassadors have agreed to follow up by seeking appointments to ram home the message to key congressional leaders. 
I will be taking the opportunity to reinforce that message to the Director General of the GATT, Peter Sutherland, when he visits Australia next week. The other important issue before the seminar, and it's more of a medium term issue but on the same matter and very important, is the early stage development of the 1995 US Farm Bill. The manner in which this bill evolves will be critical to all the Cairns Group participants and in Australia, critical to, United, to Australian agricultural trade to the United States and as a model for what might happen in other important markets. It's of direct relevance to Australian agricultural exporters, particularly sugar, dairy and beef. It's also significant in terms of its impact on the international agricultural market and export prices. It's important to note that in drafting the Farm Bill, the US will be bound by the undertakings it made in the Uruguay Round to reduce agricultural protection. So there's a plus for us, but we must watch the way in which these decisions are implemented. In recognition of the longer term significance of the 1990 Farm Bill for Australian agricultural exporters, Senator Collins and I have set up with the uh, farm leaders uh, a Farm Bill working group to coordinate Australia's activity, government and industry groups to maximise our chances of getting a decent Farm Bill outcome in the United States. We'll be meeting again in November to assess the prospects for the bill, consider the debate Minister's and look at how we can maximise our impact on this important piece of legislation. Senator Lees. Questions for Senator Collins, Minister for Primary Industry. And Minister, we welcome the extensive range of assistance measures announced yesterday for farmers in Queensland and New South Wales that are suffering from exceptional circumstances due to four years of drought. However, Minister, there are farmers in many other parts of Australia, particularly South Australia and Victoria, also suffering from ex exceptional circumstances, not only caused by lack of rain, but by years of uh, other ca calamities such as mouse plagues, um, frosts, rain during harvest. During harvest. If you add to that uh, low commodity prices as well as high interest rates, Minister, I ask you, Will there be any additional assistance for farmers in other parts of Australia suffering from exceptional circumstances who have little or no income, and for South Australia in particular, as we watch pasture and crops dying, see dams empty, and indeed tens of thousands of sheep being trucked off properties in the West just this week? How long will these farmers have to wait for assistance? Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, I would hope, and I think most of the major farm organisations would hope they would never qualify for this assistance. And, uh, I, I hope that that doesn't happen. I've actually seen expressions used such as select group, which I was extremely disappointed to see, I must say. I mean, this select group are in this select group uh, because they have, as you've said, uh, Senator Lewis, quite correctly, uh, been droughted now for four years on the trot. Um, and, and I'm not talking about oh, oh, the, significant, that's, the significance is these are not marginal lands I'm talking about. These are areas that for years have been and renowned as Australia's most arable lands, the Darling Downs of, uh, of Queensland, where farmers uh, have now suffered their eighth or ninth successive crop loss. They have had no income at all for four years. And as Senator Crowley said correctly, the criteria for this package apply nationally. And uh, I hope there wouldn't be too many more joining. And I'm sure that the, the members now of this group would be happy to opt out of it tomorrow. As I said, uh, I'm sure there's not a farmer in Australia that wouldn't. Uh, uh, exchange every dollar of what has to be um, inadequate uh, government support, even if you put a billion dollars it would be inadequate. What they actually want are some good seasons and some, and some decent rain. But the criteria do, do apply across Australia nationally, and that's one of the most significant parts of the package announced yesterday. Uh, the whole point uh, is, and as I said this yesterday, that if the drought does not break, as it's predicted by February or March next year, which could then involve other areas of Australia, uh, the fact is, at that stage, the whole country is going to be in diabolical trouble. It will then be a major domestic crisis, should it go past next autumn uh, with, uh, without any rain. We're, we're all hopeful that the Met Bureau will be proved to be correct, as long as away as that is, and, and rain will come. But uh, there's a meeting tomorrow of primary industry ministers that I've uh, uh, convened. I had a meeting several weeks ago with the South Australian Minister, Dale Baker, uh, who approached me to ask if the Commonwealth uh, would uh, give consideration to the Rural Adjustment Scheme on a regional basis, and I told him that uh, not only would we, uh, but it was very much in accord uh, with my own thinking uh, that uh, I was keen to in fact regionalise as many of the Commonwealth's programs uh, across the board as possible. 
We've actually demonstrated that in a very tangible way uh, just in the short time that I've been in this uh, portfolio with a $9 million package for restructuring that we put into South West Queensland and, I might add, a similar package we offered to New South Wales uh, because the problem, of course, goes across that artificial border in the Western Division of New South Wales where restructuring is needed. Now, the reason I raise that, Mr President, is this. There are extensive areas of Australia where, the, where one of the fundamental problems that is exacerbated by drought is major restructuring is required. Decisions were taken decades ago, generations ago, by previous governments about the particular viability of certain blocks which we know were wrong. And, uh, sadly, there are a number of farmers around Australia who will never be viable, never be viable if they have 20 good seasons. But uh, I can assure you, uh, uh, Mr President, uh, through you, uh, Senator Lewis, uh, that, uh, that if farmers in South Australia should, be cut, should end up in the same unhappy state as the, as the farmers uh, are in northern New South Wales and Queensland that have suffered extensive years of drought, then under this package, the criteria of which are uniform across the country, they will receive assistance. Senator Denman. Sorry, uh, supplementary, Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, are you saying that because the farmers in South Australia have had no income for three years for other reasons, that you don't consider that they are therefore suffering from exceptional circumstances? Just to give you some examples, in the Wooden area now it's been three years since there has been a profitable crop harvested. They trucked 26,000 sheep out of there on Tuesday alone. Just at the time wool prices are increasing, they are having to get rid of the sheep, the very things that may have indeed saved them on those properties. Is this area one of those that you are suggesting that uh, farmers should be phased out of? And if, they, if you are saying that some of these areas should, should have farming uh, phased out, then perhaps we should tell the farmers about that. What specific plans have you got to assist these farmers in South Australia, most of whom have used up their RAS entitlements totally? The Minister, Senator Collins. I don't think there are too many farmers around Australia that would argue with the central thrust of this proposal, which is to give this substantial package of assistance to the worst hit farmers. And it is a drought package. And Senator Lees, I'll happily acknowledge right here that we are not in a position, nor will we ever be, to offer compensation for the myriad problems that a primary producer faces, the ones you've mentioned, mice plagues, frost, too much rain, all these other things. We can't. That's why. That's why this has been identified as a drought package. I'd conclude by saying, and I'm delighted to have this piece of information, that today Premier Goss of Queensland has publicly committed the Queensland Government to match $20 million so that the funding uh, that we have provided in the Exceptional Circumstances grants will be matched by the Queensland Government. You'll be pleased to hear this, Senator Boswell, dollar for dollar, to allow farmers in that state to get 100 per cent interest subsidies when they need them. Senator Denman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Cook. I draw the Senator's attention to the fact that the Federal Government's campaign to attract corporate regional headquarters to Australia has been recognised by an international award this week and, might I add, accepted by our Ambassador to the Netherlands, Michael Tate. Given the emphasis placed by the government on the regional headquarters program in the May White Paper and the significant economic and cultural benefits that the regional headquarters can bring to this country, can the minister inform the Senate of the nature of the award and the stimulus that the award might bring to the regional headquarters campaign? The Minister for Industry, Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, it's indeed a very great honour for Australia that uh, this week the Australian Government received an award, the Best Campaign Award for Excellence in 1994. Mr President, the award gives international recognition to the Government's campaign to attract regional headquarters to Australia. The Ambassador, as the question indicated, our Ambassador to The Hague, former Senator, the Hon. Michael Tate, did the honours in accepting this award at the Grand Hotel. Um, Amsterdam on Tuesday evening for Australia. The award, the Best Campaign Award for Excellence 1994, was made at the fifth annual meeting of the investment promotion agencies by Corporate Location, the international investment advisory arm of the Euro Money publication. It is an award for the best campaign mounted, and our campaign, the one that attracted the award, was, of course, uh, for regional headquarters. 
It's, uh, it's Order, worthwhile Senator remarking, Kemp and Senator President, Schott, if you want to have that conversation, would you go outside? It's worthwhile remarking, Mr uh, President, when my colleagues will settle down, if they will, that, uh, that, that, while, that while the campaign attracted the award, the product that the campaign was selling is the Australian economy and the opportunity for foreign companies to set up regional headquarters in Australia. So the, uh, the person who ought to take a bow here is the Australian economy rather than the actual campaign to sell it. From, the, uh, from my department's side, can I congratulate all of those in my department that have worked on this campaign. They have worked together with Austrade, they have worked together with the state and territory governments on a very targeted campaign to attract strategic uh, investment to Australia. There are now over 650 potential uh, international targets that have been identified as, as companies that might establish regional headquarters in Australia. These companies are being systematically approached and introduced to Australia as an excellent business uh, location for them. I uh, should also say that uh, the efforts of the government sector have been strongly supported by the private sector on this issue. The Regional Headquarters Leaders Network is a group of some 20 key chief executives supported by the Australian Coalition of Service Industries. and They have worked closely with us in a public-private sector push to, uh, to join forces, represent Australia and succeed at winning a number of major companies to locate here. Over recent uh, months, the numbers of uh, companies deciding to locate their regional headquarters in Australia have increased. Let me just name a number that have uh, made the choice. Cathay Pacific is one. Uh, two major uh, computer companies, Lexmark and Data General, the uh, French international hotel chain Accor, Novell, IBM, two other uh, computer companies, Edelman's, a public relations company, a manufacturing company, uh, Heller, manufacturers of, of uh, headlights, the Campbell Soup Company, Guangzhou Television and Oracle Computer. In fact, 23 multinational companies have established regional headquarters in Australia in the last 12 months. The best estimate is that regional headquarters have generated about $500 million in investment and around about 1,000 jobs, as well as bringing major investment in information technology in particular to this country. Senator Boswell. President, my question is to Senator Collins. The issue of easing eligibility criteria for the Rural Adjustment Scheme for those without off-farm assets was not addressed by yesterday's drought statement. It is a major problem stopping many farmers from getting essential assistance to see them through the drought and beyond. Will the minister give a guarantee that the issue of eligibility will be uh, sorted out in the, uh, in the next uh, week or so? You seem to not understand the question. You don't understand the question. Maybe I could repeat. The, the Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, have you finished your question? Well, I, the, the, the question of drought eligibility under RAS is very hard to access because of criteria. Are you going to uh, lower the criteria bar? Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, a couple of significant. Uh, uh, policy changes that were made uh, in, uh, in yesterday's drought package involved um, providing significant additional resources into RAS in order to get more farmers into it. And I think that's the bottom line of Senator Boswell's. Yeah, well, that's how you get them in, Senator Boswell, by the eligibility uh, criteria. And in exceptional circumstances, uh, that is going to be uh, done. And uh, I might add, uh, Mr. President, uh, for Senator Boswell's benefit. But one of the problems that we have identified over the last uh, uh, six months in the scheme, one of the major problems in terms of, of access, is that there are not enough of there are about 12,000, uh, rough 10 to 12,000 farmers out of the total of 125,000 in Australia that are in this serious situation. That um, there are certainly um, farmers in that group uh, who uh, will need access to. Uh, uh, to the rural adjustment assistance, uh, who will now get it? And among the other uh, identified problems is that were raised with us was restriction in the actual limits on the amount that could be borrowed. The people, in fact, had borrowed to the limit, were still able, because of the, the very valuable nature of the basic asset, to borrow more 
but couldn't do it because of, uh, of the restriction on well, the existing restriction on the caps. And also, a major problem was that people who should have been getting 100 per cent subsidy, in other words, an interest-free loan, weren't getting it. And one of the reasons for that, frankly, Senator Boswell, is because the way the scheme works is that we fund the lion's share of it up to 50 per cent. 90 per cent is provided by the Commonwealth, and over 50 per cent, they have to, not unreasonably, the states have to match us dollar for dollar. And there has been some reluctance, and that's why I read out the statement from Premier Goss that I was delighted to see. There has been some reluctance. Well, I'll tell you, a couple of years ago when this happened, the facts were, and I, and I don't want to uh, be any politicking on this because that's not how I handle it, but the facts were, a couple of years ago when this happened, Queensland agreed to match us dollar for dollar, and it was very aggravating for those farmers in, in northern New South Wales when farmers on that side of the border were getting 100 per cent interest subsidies, and they weren't. We were putting our share in, but the New South Wales government refused to match us dollar for dollar. Plenty of rhetoric, but no action. Now I hope that will change tomorrow uh, at this meeting, and I am delighted, Senator Boswell, to see a public commit commitment today from the Premier of Queensland, because they have been doing it, and he's made the point in his press release that his state is the only state that's doing it. We'll put an additional $20 million uh, into uh, this uh, desperate problem and help the Queensland farmers get that 100 per cent subsidy. So the caps have been raised on RAS to allow people to borrow more. More money has been put into exceptional circumstances, Senator Boswell, to make it now a demand-driven system rather than a cash-limited system, a major breakthrough. I'd simply conclude uh, by saying, Mr President, that these are substantial policy changes. They will actually require, I think it's something like seven acts of parliament to be amended here in this Senate, and I look forward to have them, having them given speedy passage Senator Boswell, I hope this is not another Marbo debate or gaze in Tasmania or, uh, or land fund debate in here, because if it is, I have got no doubt you will be beaten to death by farmers in both uh, northern New South Wales and Queensland. I will make my contribution to this by not speaking for more than five minutes on each bill, and perhaps you will absolutely cross my heart and hope to die, and perhaps we could give these bills put the clock on me and perhaps we could give these bills, Senator Boswell. Speedy assistance, speedy the sooner you get, the better. I, I, uh, I, I, Mr President, look forward to seeing these amendments pass speedily through the Senate so that this desperately needed assistance for the farmers in Queensland and New South Wales can be delivered. And a fat lot of good you've been, Senator Macdonald, Order. because you haven't made a single representation to me Sir, on Minister, behalf of drought-affected farmers in the North Minister's, Queensland. Minister's Not time has one. expired. Order. Supplementary, Senator Boswell. Thank you, Mr. President. I think I can give the minister. Order. The, uh, we minister can't hear Mr. Senator Boswell. It's important. I think I Senator can give Boswell. the minister a guarantee and an assurance that the bills won't be held up unduly. My. Uh, <coughs> My, uh, my, my supplementary question is, in your answer you indicated that the criteria situation would be addressed, you, uh, but you weren't specific and, and to tell the Senate when. When are you going to address this? The Minister, Senator Collins. He said it about 500 times on the public record uh, over the last three or four weeks. We're doing it now, and I can assure you, uh, Senator Boswell, that uh, we will uh, uh, give it uh, expeditious treatment. And could I once again, Senator Boswell, as I've done before, commend you on your assiduous efforts on behalf of the farmers of North Queensland? And of course you need to be particularly, particularly active, considering that some of your other colleagues from North Queensland, like Senator Macdonald, have been Order. totally silent on the issue. Senator Shamaret. Mr President, my question is directed to the Minister representing the Attorney General, and I ask one, has the Attorney General received over the last 12 months repeated suggestions from the Australian Law Reform Commission that the Minister refer gay and lesbian law reform to the Commission for inquiry? Two, why has the Attorney General not referred the matter of gay and lesbian law reform to the Commission for inquiry despite strong support from gay and lesbian groups around Australia? And three, does the Attorney General intend to make such a referral? And if not, why not? <laughs> the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Evans. Mr. President, I'm informed that the Attorney General has received a submission from the new head of the Law Reform Commission, Alan Rose, outlining a number of inquiries which the Law Reform Commission may wish to undertake over the next year. The Law Reform Commission has nominated 16 topics for potential inquiries covering the whole range of human rights, social justice, business, and public law. 
protection of individual rights, which would of course encompass the rights of all Australians, regardless of sexual preference, is indeed one of the topics under consideration. I understand the Attorney General has yet to have discussions with Mr Rose to finalise the program, but I'll bring, his, I'll bring your question uh, to his attention so that he knows of your interest uh, in the matter. I'm certainly glad, Mr President, that the Greens do clearly understand the nature of the issues of principle involved in gay and lesbian law reform, and in particular that they so obviously share the government's view and the view of the overwhelming majority of Australians that governments have no business whatever in anyone's bedroom and that uh, sexual practices between consenting adults are entirely and should remain entirely their own business. And in that respect, of course, there's a conspicuous contrast to be drawn between that, uh, your position and our position and that of that once great party and once great coalition opposite who manifestly uh, fails to understand the basic issues that are here involved and which is presently divided between that large slice of them who regard uh, the issues involved in the current uh, government legislation, for example, as all about sodomy and other ways of encouraging godlessness. There's another group who uh, argue that it's all about states' rights. You've got another small group of crazed eccentrics like Wilson Tucky who say it's about genital mutilation. And there's only a tiny point handful order. that understand that it's about— Point of order. Point, point, order. point of order. On a point of I order, think Senator, uh, the leader of the government in the Senate made a serious reflection on a member of the other House and he shall withdraw it. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying close attention. And if uh, I, I would ask you to withdraw, if you withdraw the reference to Wilson Tucky as a crazed eccentric, that uh, is a problem for Senator Panizza. He's not an eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> the shadow right. cabinet this morning may have uh, purported to do something about patching up their differences on this particular matter, but I understand the issue is still a live one uh, right now in the uh, in the party room. And I'm sure it will be the case that, like a, a worm cut into two or three or four or more different pieces, we're going to see Order. the different bits going on writhing Order. in public Senator Kemp. on this issue as Senator on so Kemp. many others over the period ahead. And it's a very tragic thing to see this once great party sacrificing and throwing away any shred of decency in its fundamental principles in this respect. Supplementary Senator Shamaret. I think it wouldn't have escaped the notice of the opposition that the minister didn't actually answer my question and took the opportunity to make a few cracks. And I'd like to repeat the question, which is what priority does the Attorney General place on the uh, Law Reform Commission's request for a referral and when is it likely to be given that priority? The Minister, Senator Evans, I would ask you way of responding to giving you such a nice little rap. But the uh, Attorney General is a deeply caring and sensitive and compassionate soul, as we're all aware, who does understand the nature of the issues that are involved uh, in gay and lesbian law reform, as you so obviously do yourself, uh, Senator Shamrett. And I'm sure you'll take uh, very seriously uh, into account in discussing with uh, Mr. Rose the priority areas of reference for the Law Reform Commission, just that particular area. But I can't preempt his judgment on that. He hasn't yet had an opportunity to discuss the matter in detail with Mr. Rose. Senator McGibbon. This is to Senator Evans, as the Minister for Foreign Affairs. And I just ask you, Minister, how much longer are you going to tolerate that grossly insulting sign outside the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not aware of the particular sign to which you're referring. You're, you're referring to the Timor Embassy thing across the road. Well, I'm not sure of the particular sign to which Senator McGibbon is referring. In any event, these matters are essentially ones for the ACT uh, administration rather than the federal government. There is a capacity uh, for the government to act, as we have done in the past, uh, in relation to uh, certain things that constitute uh, I've forgotten the precise language of the, uh, the statute, but an interference in effect with the, uh, with the effective capacity to operate in term of the mission in terms of our responsibilities under the Vienna Convention. I'm not sure of the particular thing to which you're referring, but I don't think it's the case that there would be a foundation uh, on which we could act in this respect at the moment. Senator Carter, supplementary, Senator McGibbon. If so, I'm, I'm, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that the, uh, the minister doesn't know what's outside the Indonesian embassy, but for a party that proclaims that it's doing something to promote Australian-Indonesian relations, to tolerate a huge multicoloured sign that's been there for a long while in front of a friendly nation is absolutely intolerable. It's, uh, I'd like you to instance how many other embassies that Australia has around the world are subject to similar treatment. Name me the countries and tell me the number of Australian embassies that are similarly outraged. The Minister, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. President, while it is the case that we take the view that uh, protests 
should remain, of course, within the bounds of the law and should also remain within the bounds of decent respect for property, for national symbols and for differing cultures and countries with whom we might have differing points of view. It is the case that we do continue to acknowledge the right of peaceful demonstration as a very valued and indeed centrally core part of our system of democracy and freedom of expression. And I'm constantly in the position of having to uh, uh, live with uh, what might desirably uh, be situations that uh, didn't exist in terms of uh, dealing with countries. Uh, and issues of this sensitive kind. Uh, but over and over again, I simply have to make the point that in the kind of uh, democracy we are, that's part of the deal, uh, to tolerate that diversity, to tolerate uh, that, uh, that freedom of expression. And I think that's pretty well understood by the countries in question. I'm sure it's well understood by the Indonesian government. Senator Carr. Mr President, my question without notice is to the minister representing the Minister for Schools. That's to Senator Schott. It concerns Commonwealth education programs in Victoria. Is the minister aware of media reports based upon a leaked state government briefing paper that the Victorian Education Department is a, is a budget blowout of $143 million? Is the minister aware that the state government has already cut edu the education budget in by $78 million this year, which follows extremely large cuts over the last two years? Can the minister assure the Senate that the Commonwealth education programs in Victoria will not be undermined by further cuts by the state government to Victorian schools, education programs, staff or facilities. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, Senator Schott. Yes, yes, Mr President. Uh, Senator Carr being a concerned Senator from Order. Victoria, uh, uh, raising this question is, is obvious. There have, and I am aware, uh, Mr President, that there have been reports uh, about uh, the Kennett government in Victoria's cutbacks in, in education. Apparently the reports canvass possible further redundancies of up to 1,000 teachers, the apparently unknown effects on schooling of cuts already made, and the use of statewide testing for public comparison between schools. Throughout this turmoil, Mr President, that's the, Vic the Victorian education system uh, has closed over 200 uh, schools, reduced teacher numbers by 8,000. Point, point of order. Despite this, Senate, Mr President, order. Point of order, Senator, Senator, Mr. President, uh, Senator Evans, in an earlier point of order, uh, pointed out that uh, answers should only be given to questions which relate to the responsibility of the respective minister. Uh, I ask you to uh, uh, find out what, what possible responsibility does Senator Schott and if her colleagues have for education in Victoria, and I ask you to enforce the standing order. I to enforce the standing order that Senator Evans brought to your attention earlier today. Order. I, on the point of order, Senator Ray. Uh, so I don't think Senator Kemp heard. Senator Carr asked a general question about schools, but then went on to ask, in terms of Commonwealth funding, which is very substantial in the Victorian or any other state education system, how that would be affected. So, Mr. President, the question was entirely within order. The qu Point of order. 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 Senator Kemp raised the, before you. On the point of order. On the point of order. Yes, on, on the point of order. That if the issue, as you say, Senator Ray, is um, the issue of, of uh, funding from uh, the Commonwealth government, we haven't had one word of that from Senator Schott. Not not one word of that. So uh, if, if the issue, if Senator Ray is right, the issue is Commonwealth funding. Let's let's get the answer to that question. Order, Senator. On the point of order, Senator. Just as Schott. Senator Kemp was starting to get excited and jump up and down, I was then starting to refer to the Commonwealth funding for Victoria. And I, and I was going to then go on and explain, as Order. I will, the Commonwealth yeah. funding of, for education in Victoria. Order. The, the question was in order and so was the answer. Senator Schott. Ah, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr President. As I was about to say before Senator Kemp jumped up uh, with his, well, with his up unnecessary or well, jumped up Senator Kemp uh, <laughs> with his unnecessary uh, uh, point of order. The, the, Commonwealth government, the, Com the Commonwealth Government in Victoria, uh, has, in this present year, has provided $296 million, has provided $296 million the which is the maintenance of funding in real terms. This contrasts with the Victorian Government making a cut of $78 million in real terms in 1994-95. 
We have maintained our funding to schools in Victoria. The Victorian government has cut it by $78 million. And of course, we acknowledge, Mr. President, that we are not about how to tell state governments to run their school systems. But there are two points about the policy and practice which I think should be made. Firstly, the policy, the, this highlights the critical need for all systems to develop adequate methods of reporting the outcomes of schooling. Most states are investing considerable time and money working towards ways of assess, assessing and reporting learning and management outcomes. Apparently, Mr Hayward, the Victorian Education Minister, believes this type of approach is, and I quote, a lot of rubbish. Debate about education should be about the quality of outcomes, not about the input of resources alone. For the sake of their students, I hope the Victorian government will come to terms with this and will follow the, other ex the example of other states in this matter. Secondly, it is quite clear that the outcome reporting should not be reliant on simple basic skill testing. What children are able to achieve as a result of their schooling is dependent upon the interaction of parents, the principals in schools, the teachers the, and the resources, and the students themselves. To reduce the outcomes of schooling to a pen and paper test undermines the quality of our schools. Using a year's basic skill test to generate invidious comparisons between schools is really an attack on the whole process. Well, of course you will want to... Of course, oh, you, of course you, coming from an elite school system, the, Geelong, the representative oh, of Geelong Gav, Grammar... Well, Mr President, a Scotch college, down as fag oh, no. over here from Scotch College. Uh, this is now as fag from the private order. Order. The point of order, Senator. I ask, you asked Mr. Senator Schott to withdraw that uh, comment on Senator uh, Kemp. Well, I, I didn't see anything unparliamentary in it, I must say, unless there's something I missed. Do, Mr. Pre uh, well, Mr. President, withdraw the comment in the interests of Senate Harmony, will you please? Well, Senator? in the interest of Senate Harmony, but I must say the term "fag" is well known mm. as a system in the in the private school system of this country and in Great Britain, of which this pe these people opposite represent. No. But in, the, in your, uh, in, in deference to your request, Mr. President, I certainly withdraw it. So we have we have the op the, the opposition wanting uh, here supporting Mr. Kennett wanting to reduce the outcomes of schools, as I say, to a pen and paper test. And uh, we will not, in this side of politics, take such a simple, simplistic approach to education policy as you lot opposite support Mr Kennett going about in Victoria reducing the quality of education for ordinary students, not the ones you represent going to the private school system. Senator Chi. Mr President, my question is addressed to Senator Evans representing the Prime Minister. It relates to visits by the Prime Minister of Ireland, Mr Reynolds, and the Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr Go, and in asking the question, I'd like it noted that I was a former member of the executive of the Australia Island Parliamentary Group. Why is it, though, that when Mr Reynolds visit, visited Canberra, the government chose to honour him with an official dinner in the Great Hall of Parliament, yet when Mr Go visited, he was merely hosted to a private dinner at the Lodge? Given that I am advised that the Prime Minister's Department made all of the arrangements for Mr Goh's visit, and they were presumably approved by the Prime Minister, can you provide an explanation of the differing treatment provided to these two international leaders? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Represented them. Well, the only reason I'm aware why there wasn't a full-scale Great Hall dinner for um, President Goh was there was a non-parliamentary sitting week. It was the only week in which he could be here. And the government, I think, uh, rather responsibly took the view uh, that it would be inappropriate to spend the enormous amount of taxpayers' money in use, sending the usual invitations to members of parliament and others to come from all around the country. And it has often been the practice, when distinguished visitors have been here otherwise than during uh, parliamentary sitting weeks, uh, that other forms of hospitality have been offered. But I might uh, set the record straight for uh, Senator O'Chee. It wasn't only a dinner at the lodge that was offered for uh, Prime Minister Go. Uh, there was, in fact, a, a dinner in, or a lunch in Parliament House attended by a number of ministers and a number of other uh, distinguished guests for some 80 or 90 people, uh, which was appropriately uh, targeted uh, for the nature of the occasion and the nature of the visitor uh, in, a in a circumstance where um, the parliament was not sitting. Moreover, your own leader, your own leader Mr Fisher, 
seconded the Prime Minister's speech of welcome to Mr Goh and, in a speech of great dignity and great uh, charm, uh, responded in a way that was absolutely appropriate for the occasion. He showed a lot more charm and a lot more dignity and a lot more sense and a lot better information than you've demonstrated on this occasion. Supplement? Supplement. Order. Well, well, if you were over there and like Senator to keep Chief. quiet, you might actually find out that I knew about the lunch as well and wasn't intending to raise the matter to save you a little bit of embarrassment. But is the minister aware? Order on my right. Is the minister aware that there is a need for a certain sensitivity because when quite apparently different treatment is offered to two ministers within the space of a couple of weeks, it reduces all of the prime minister's rhetoric about becoming closer and more attuned to Asia to just so much puff. And that is the concern that I've got. And I believe the government could handle it much better. And there was not even an invitation delivered to most members of parliament. And that is a matter of concern. And if this government wishes to treat a leader like Mr Gove oh, no, with a little bit right. of respect, at Senator least that Ray. could have been done. The Minister, Senator Evans. There's only one thing that could possibly embarrass Prime Minister Go arising out of his visit to Australia, and that's the contribution that you have just made in this particular parliament. Go Chok Tong is a man of the utmost distinction, the utmost character, and someone with whom the Prime Minister of Australia has a very close relationship indeed, both in policy terms and in personal terms. He is someone who has been a very, very strong uh, supporter and acted jointly with us in the initiatives for trade liberalisation and regional security and otherwise that we've been mounting around the region. I, there are some relationships as close as our relationship with Singapore and our personal relationship uh, at the prime ministerial level with Mr Go Chok Tong, uh, but there is no leader or no relationship in the region that I think is more close. And for you to make that kind of point in that kind of cheap, grandstanding way is not only to totally misunderstand the nature of that particular relationship, it's to demonstrate that you just don't have the character to sit in this place. Senator, Senator Spindler. Thank order, you, Mr President. Order. There's a point of order, Senator O'Chief. I want that comment withdrawn, Mr President. That is thoroughly and utterly reprehensible and despicable. Order. And it shows, it shows, it shows, it shows the contempt that Senator Evans order. has for the proper parliamentary process. I think you should withdraw, Senator Evans. It's a reflection on the senator. Well, it's certainly a reflection. It was a very deliberate one, but in deference to you, I withdraw it. I, I, I did ask you to withdraw, and that's an unconditional withdrawal. Well, it was unconditional, but I've repeated. Thank you. I withdraw it unconditional. Thank you, Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Sport and Territory, Senator Faulkner. I refer to reports that clear fell logging and wood chipping are imminent in the high conservation value Hensley Creek catchment in East Gippsland, which contains old growth forest, is listed on the register of the national estate and is a state site of rainforest significance. I ask the Minister. Order. Senator Spindler is asking a serious question. It demands serious attention. Senator Spindler. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Minister provide urgent interim protection for Hensley Creek catchment in order to conserve the area for inclusion in the National Reserve System, and when will, we, will he do so? And secondly, given the recent Victorian Government report exposing the extent of breaches by the timber industry of the Victorian Code of Forest Practices, is the Minister prepared to establish a Commonwealth monitoring function to ensure <laughs> compliance with state codes and Commonwealth Woodchip Licence conditions. The Minister for Environment, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I have, um, I have received a letter which has been co-signed by a number of Victorian voluntary conservation organisations expressing uh, concern about the planned commencement Excuse of logging uh, operations in the, the Hensley uh, Creek catchment in East Gippsland. The conservation uh, organisations have sent me uh, further information on the conservation values of the area, and this has only, this has only just been brought to uh, my attention this morning. My portfolio has not had the opportunity yet uh, to uh, evaluate this uh, additional information, uh, Senator. The conser conservation organisations have been uh, invited uh, to provide uh, my department with uh, substantiated information on areas considered to have high conservation values. Mr President, I am committed to implementing the National uh, Forest Policy Statement 
and I will be advising the Minister for Resources on areas uh, likely, to be, likely to be of high conservation uh, value, which uh, should be avoided prior to the issuing of any uh, export wood chip licences uh, for next year. In line with the National Forest Policy uh, Statement, uh, an assessment of uh, old growth forest has been completed for the East Gippsland forests. In addition, the Australian Heritage Commission is currently finalising a study of national estate values for forests in that area. Uh, these two studies put my portfolio I think, in a good position uh, to assess the information supplied by the conservation organisations. In the interim, I have uh, referred the uh, letter I mentioned to the Minister for Resources for further investigation. My department will, uh, will uh, follow up the uh, new information with the Department of Primary Industries and Energy. And once more, information has been uh, provided uh, to me by my department and the AHC. I'll consider what further action might need to be taken in consultation with my colleague, the Minister for Resources, Mr Bettle. Uh, can I say that uh, since becoming the Minister for the Environment, uh, Senator, uh, one of my priorities has been to address the implementation of the National uh, Forest Policy Statement. It has certainly been reflected in the nature of the advice I gave to the Minister for Resources over the, uh, uh, the uh, sawmillers uh, export uh, proprietary limit, better known as CEPL, uh, export uh, licence. I also proposed uh, to the minister that uh, CEPL report annually on their uh, wood chip uh, export activities and that this particular mechanism be backed up by a uh, monitoring capacity. My department has had preliminary discussions uh, with the Department of Primary Industries and Energy uh, concerning uh, monitoring compliance with export licence uh, conditions. And, uh, once those options have been uh, further developed, which of course is a process that is continuing, then I certainly will be discussing those options further with Mr Bettle, the Minister for Resources. Supplementary, Senator Spindler. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but seeing that the Hensley Creek issue is particularly urgent, I wonder if he can give the Senate some indication of the time scale of responding to that particular aspect of the question. The Minister, Senator Faulkner. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Senator, I can add very little to what I said to you. I had received some uh, advice in relation to what was occurring, and as I mentioned, uh, my office uh, has received, uh, received uh, this morning some, uh, some uh, further supporting evidence from some voluntary conservation organisations. I indicated in my answer to you that uh, I would, uh, would uh, examine that uh, advice as quickly uh, as, uh, as possible, and that is in train now. But I, I do, I do uh, stress with you, Senator, it literally has been made available uh, and uh, passed through to me only within the past few hours. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Cook. M Mr uh, President, a question was asked of Senator McMullen by Senator Watson on Tuesday concerning a recent draft taxation ruling on the investment and development allowances and the effect this will have on public infrastructure projects. The Hansard page I'm informed is page 963. I've obtained an answer to this question by the from the Treasurer, and the answer goes as follows. Taxation draft rulings represent the preliminary, though considered, views of the Commissioner of Taxation. Draft rulings are released publicly to allow a period of consultation before being finalised. The Commissioner has advised that the draft taxation ruling TR 94 oblique stroke D 37 does not represent a change to the Australian Taxation Officer's approach to the grant of rights to use property. The draft ruling is a consolidation with improved explanation of years of case law and of past public rulings by the Australian Taxation Office. Granting rights to use an asset can preclude access to the investment allowance and the development allowance. That restriction has been part of such provisions since 1976 
and is the subject of several public rulings by the Australian Taxation Office and of several reported decisions of courts and tribunals. The provisions of section 51 oh, order, order. There's too much, too much noise. Section oh, 51 capital A capital D also may be triggered by granting rights to use an asset to particular classes of taxpayer or for particular purposes. This provision has been in effect since 1982. As the ATO has not changed its approach to the application of these provisions, the Commissioner said there was no case, no cases of which it is aware where public infrastructure projects entered into on the basis of the ATO's approach would be prejudiced if the draft ruling became final without changing. If in a particular case a taxpayer has a private, has a private ruling from the ATOA in, in respect of a particular arrangement, then generally the taxpayer will be able to rely on that ruling for the year to which it relates, notwithstanding an inconsistent public ruling. End of answer. Senator Crowley. Acting Deputy President, um, Mr Deputy President, uh, on the September 1, 1994, Senator Patterson asked me a question without notice regarding Strathton Lodge, a dementia-specific unit for uh, aged care. I seek leave to have a further answer incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Are there any motions to take note of answers? That, that Order 190, I seek to make a, a person, personal explanation. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator uh, Kemp. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, during the uh, answer from Senator Schott, there was a very oh, unpleasant— oh, oh, point of order, Senator Kemp. Well, is it a personal explanation on the basis of claim to be misrepresent, misrepresented? Well, it, it, under 190, that's the provision, Senator Kemp. Oh, that's right. the okay. provision, yes. Sir. yes. Thank you, Senator Se Schott. Senator, Senator Kemp. Uh, Mr. Um, Deputy President, uh, during the answer from Senator Schott, there was a very unpleasant attack on all people who attended private schools. And uh, I would like to stand up and defend the many thousands, hundreds of thousands of Australians who go to private schools. And I'd point out to Senator Schott that Mr Keating's children go to private schools. Senator Evans' children have gone to private schools, and indeed large numbers of people on the front bench have sent their children to private schools. And could you, on the next day of sitting, supply the information to the Senate of the number of Labor ministers who have sent their children to private schools? Yeah. Yeah, Senator Kent, a, fa a fairly dubious point of order, Senator Kent. S Senator Schott. On, uh, on, the point of, on the point of order, I claim to be misrepresented. I did not. Is leave granted? No, no objection. Senator Schott. I did not. I did not in any way claim to say that all people who attended private, attacking people who attended private school. I, I was saying that those who, those people opposite, some of who attended private schools, the interest you represent seems always to promote the interests of the rich schools vis-à-vis -vis the rest, and that is what that is what I order. The point I was making. Order, order, order. Sen Sen Senator Baum, do you claim to be misrepresented? I claim to have been misrepresented. Uh, is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Baum. Senator Schott, in fact, said, and he referred to me and my colleagues, describing us as representatives of the private school system. That was exact, an exact quote. I took it down. I, uh, in fact, was educated entirely by the state school system, as were many of my colleagues. It is simply incorrect to classify me as such, although maybe I might have preferred, who knows, to, had I had the opportunity, to go to uh, a, a private school. The fact is, a large proportion of the uh, members on this side had the benefits of state school education. I'm proud of that education. Not only was educated by the state school system, I, I also attended North Sydney Boys High School, as did many of my colleagues attend similar uh, schools. And it is divisive and uh, trying to uh, generate class, uh, class consciousness, uh, which is totally un unacceptable, Mr. Uh, Mr. Act, Mr Deputy President. The Senator shot to behave in this way it demeans the, uh, uh, the parliamentary process and more, it demeans him, if that is possible. Senator Reid. Mr Deputy President, I seek leave of the Senate to pre present a petition to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Reid. 
Mr Deputy President, I present a petition containing 740 signatures addressed to Senator Evans as Minister from Foreign Affairs, which I accepted from a group of people uh, outside Parliament House last Sunday, who I addressed briefly, relating to the situation in Burma, in particular our Sun Suu Kyi and the operations of the Slork government. The petition sets out in more detail the views of those who have signed it, and I would seek leave to present it to Senator Evans. Leave granted. Objection. Leave is granted. Are there any motions to take note of answer? Senator, Senator, Senator Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Acting. Uh, sorry, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I move to take note of the answer given by Senator Collins to Senator Lee's question today. And uh, I understand that the, the minister had to leave the chamber, and he did give me the courtesy of saying that he, he, he was sorry that he couldn't stay. But I know that uh, the minister and all, certainly all senators on this side would be well aware by now that the measures announced yesterday by the Prime Minister uh, with regards to drought specifically exclude South Australia because that state is currently unable to declare drought in affected regional areas. Now, the Prime Minister said that in his approach to the problem of exceptional drought circumstances that he was fulfilling his commitment not to leave farm families in distressed circumstances behind. Now, I know that that was what he said in his statement, but I'm just wondering how he can really explain that statement to a large majority of South Australian farmers, particularly those uh, on Air Peninsula and in the Murray Mallee, who are seriously drought affected and will continue to suffer unless funds are urgently provided. Now, Senator Lee's asked this question, and uh, as usual, the, Democrat, uh, the Democrats find some interest in rural affairs. And I was interested to note that uh, Senator Lee's, in her question, uh, mentioned the fact that there was a truckload of sheep leaving Woodna uh, to be taken to the market. Some 26,000 left the area. Uh, I wonder, uh, had the Democrats had their way, uh, as their policy was at the last election, and added an extra 18 cents uh, a litre to fuel, uh, just whether those farmers would have been able to afford to send those sheep to market uh, under their particular policy that they had at that time. But. Uh, I, I understand that uh, one of the reasons because there are not, uh, you cannot declare drought in a regional affected area. I understand that two weeks ago uh, Senator Collins agreed to a request from the South Australian Minister for Primary Industries to accept the scientifically based criteria for the declaration of drought within regions of that state. Now, I understand that uh, the scientifically based criteria has been forwarded to both the Minister, and the, uh, Minister for Primary Industries and the Prime Minister at lunchtime today. And I understand uh, that once it was received, it would then allow this criteria to be used to trigger regional drought declarations in South Australia. Now, I understand there is a process that does have to be gone through before that can happen, but I would hope if Senator Lees and the Democrats who... who uh, the Demo Let me say... There are regions in South Australia, and this needs to be put into place so that regions can be declared drought and not the whole state can be declared drought. Now, I hope that Senator Lees and the Democrats uh, will immediately support the actions of the South Australian Liberal government and certainly support the actions of coalition senators in this place when it comes to the time for this uh, trigger uh, to, to be put into place, because it is absolutely essential that people in South Australia in regions and because of the diversity of South Australia, it's a very rare situation for the whole of the, the whole of the state to be in a drought situation. But there are many, many large areas of South Australia that have been suffering adverse conditions now for a number of years. And already uh, on Northern Air Peninsula and in parts of the Murray Mallee, there are people who will not get a crop this year. Uh, I will be going over to visit that area next week myself. But let me say that uh, there needs to be special circumstances for areas such as this, and they are very large areas and very large grain producing areas. Let me say that one of the problems that we've seemed to face is that the only way that an area can be declared a drought uh, area or the only way that any assistance can be provided is for the Prime Minister to visit. And it's taken months and months now for the Prime Minister to be dragged into the areas of New South Wales and to Queensland, where the drought has been so severe for so long, and I would have thought, I would have thought that, uh, with all that has been said in this chamber and in the public arena regarding the drought in northern New South Wales 
and in Queensland that a visit would have been paid to, to these areas by the Prime Minister far sooner than this. It, it, it doesn't seem to take much effort to get uh, uh, the Prime Minister to visit uh, bushfires or floods, but in effect we have a prolonged, serious situation and have had for a number of years in many parts of South Australia, as well as those areas uh, I know in uh, northern New South Wales and Queensland that have suffered so much. I hope that relief measures can be made available, particularly to those farm families who are suffering so greatly uh, in many parts of South Australia. And I would certainly urge the uh, federal government to do what it has to do to act as quickly as possible now that these criteria have been forwarded to them uh, so that the suffering that's currently being suffered by these people in such adverse conditions uh, can be put right in the same way that, is, that many people uh, in the rest of Australia have received the benefits of drought assistance. Senator Carr, are you on the same subject? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, there's a number of speakers on the same subject. I apologise. Senator Campbell. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I won't delay the Senate too much. I was uh, at uh, about 20 minutes past seven this morning appalled to hear the uh, Minister for Primary Industries on the Alan Jones uh, breakfast program on 2UE um, take what was a blatant and cheap political shot, saying that he hoped that the coalition senators in the Senate would not delay the passage of, I think it's the seven acts that require um, amendment to implement the drought package. I thought it was a very cheap shot. I happened to be on the, on the program uh, straight after uh, Senator Collins explaining to the uh, explaining to Alan Jones, not in considerable listening audience, about the money that this government has wasted in its various failed government dealings, uh, business dealings uh, from some of the businesses in DAS. But uh, I was going to go across to Senator Collins during question time and say that I did think it was a cheap shot, and just because he was talking on Sydney Radio Rural in Canberra that we had actually caught him out. Because the coalition, as you know, Mr Deputy President, has uh, been very proactive on the issue of uh, of uh, coming up with a broad-ranging drought package, which was announced many weeks ago, and there's no doubt that we all welcome the government's commitment to the uh, to the drought package. But certainly, uh, it was a, a belated package, and uh, but one that one we no doubt um, welcome uh, anyway. So it was, of course, even more uh, surprising, I thought, for for Minister Collins, even though he does take the cheap political shot whenever he can get it. Uh, to repeat what he said on the radio this morning here in the parliament this afternoon. The coalition understands very well the plight of those who are stricken by drought right around Australia and, and have understood it, I'm sure, far better than the Prime Minister specifically um, for many, many years, as Senator Ferguson quite correctly uh, interjects. But, uh, Mr Deputy President, if uh, he wants to score cheap political points on, uh, on, on radio programs, it's not the way to handle what is a national crisis that has the potential of ruining the lives of thousands of Australians uh, right across this nation, be they the people who suffer uh, because they are on the land and suffering the consequences of the drought, or be they um, citizens right around this nation who will, of course, have their own economic well-being and living standards affected by a continuation of this uh, disastrous uh, national uh, disaster in the drought. Senator Panizza. Mr. President, or Deputy President, uh, I was a speaker on the same subject, and uh, I welcome the package that the government has brought down to assist the farmers in drought. But uh, while doing so, I'm questioning exactly to where it's going, because it seems to me, by this definition, uh, in uh, extreme drought, you. Uh, how you define extreme drought. And I believe, well, I know that RAS uh, system has got a way of describing it or, or defining it, but uh, I haven't understood uh, how many, I don't really know how many have really understood it and, and worked out who is, available, who is available for it and not. Because there are ex pockets of Western Australia, and I mentioned this morning, Air Peninsula in South Australia, that is in the situation of being in financial difficulties. And when it comes to uh, families putting bread on the table, if I may say so, well then I think it's, uh, they could be very much in the same situation as people in New South Wales or Queensland and parts of Victoria. It could be exactly the same situation. And uh, uh, 
you know, someone's got to tell us, or the government's got to tell us what they are going to do from then. As I mentioned yesterday, you've got the Esperance area, southeast region of Western Australia, that's in a, uh, a pretty bad way this year, even though they had a reasonable year last year. But uh, uh, as Senator Ferguson, I think, mentioned, uh, the Air Peninsula of South Australia could be in the same situation. And the Mallee of Victoria, that's correct. Parts of the Mallee of Victoria and South Australia. Uh, well, surely it doesn't stop at the borderline, uh, Senator Chapman. Uh, droughts seem to don't follow borders. But the point is, say, I do welcome the, the measures that I've done on the social security way because it gets to the core of the family. I also welcome the OSTUDY measures. And uh, I'd just like to mention the uh, uh, RAS guidelines. There is quite a push to change those guidelines to make uh, finance more easily available. I caution uh, the Senate a bit on that because I saw the experiences in Western Australia of the 76-77 droughts and also the 1983 drought that got farmers into more, uh, more strife than it got them out of by making the money too easily available. I believe in the RAS system as long as it's administered properly and I always said that in Western Australia it wasn't administered properly for just things I said because there was deserving farmers that were, you could see they're going to be viable in the long run and they weren't helped and there was others helped that you could see that they weren't going to be viable in the long run and it helped those go over the line completely. We're the ones that probably battled for themselves, got there in the long run and are solid now. So I do uh, caution the Senate on moving too far down that line. But I mean, we've got to look forward, Mr Deputy President, to when this drought is over and the government has got to put measures in place to make sure that resources are available to farmers when we do get out of drought and build up. Because as, uh, as sure as we are on this earth, there will be another drought another time somewhere. So we've got to work towards that by conserving fodder and conserving cash. Uh, the government has made a mention in the, in the release on drought that the, they're looking at investment allowance for building storage and dams and extra dams for water. But I don't think that will help farmers too much that are coming out of the drought for at least four or five years they'll have a low income. And uh, what's the point in allowing uh, further investment allowance if uh, you don't uh, have any income that you're paying tax on. So really th th that one doesn't mean much. But where the government has really got to look is putting IEDs back in the place. And the sort of IEDs that we had before, uh, namely under the, well, under the Fraser government, which used to work all right, there was a massive amount in there that uh, were used, including the 1982 drought, 1982 drought in the east and 1983 drought in the west. Though uh, it did come very useful, but unfortunately, due mostly to a friend of mine who used to be on the other side, Peter Walsh, he reckons they've been rorted. I couldn't see where they've been rorted, and the system was changed, and uh, the total in the fund went from about 300 million, if I'm correct, way down, I think there might be, I don't know, 50 or 60 million in there. So they are useless as they stand, and I ask the government to bring them back to where they used to be. Senator, Senator McGibbon. From subject, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I understood it was the same subject. Senator Chapman. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I want to join uh, Senator Ferguson in expressing my great concern and disappointment that the drought relief package announced yesterday does not, as the situation currently stands in South Australia, apply to those farmers on the Eyre Peninsula and in the Murray Mallee of South Australia who are suffering at this stage of the season the devastating impact of drought. Because, of course, the reason for that is that in South Australia at the moment there is no criteria whereby the concept of extreme drought can be determined to enable the re relief package to apply to farmers in that state. And of course, the blame for that lies fairly and squarely with the Labor Party. Because we had in South Australia, in office for a decade, a Labor government in that state that paid scant regard to the needs of the rural people of South Australia. And that scant regard is no better demonstrated than by the fact that during that uh, long period in office, they failed to put in place 
appropriate criteria whereby uh, extreme drought could be rec recognised uh, when it struck. And so what, uh, what uh, we now have is a drought package announced last night that won't be applicable to those farmers in South Australia. To his great credit, uh, the present Minister for Agriculture in South Australia, Dale Baker, or Minister for Primary Industries, Dale Baker, under the new uh, Liberal government in that state, has been working uh, assiduously to develop uh, appropriate criteria which might be acceptable and might be recognised by the federal government. And, uh, he will be putting those, uh, putting those propositions to the federal minister, Senator Collins, at a meeting tomorrow. And the proposal will be that uh, there will be a specific scientifically based criteria whereupon South Australian farmers could trigger the exceptional drought uh, circumstances and thereby benefit from the package that was announced last night. So it remains, Mr Deputy President, for me along with Senator Ferguson to urge Senator Collins in the strongest possible terms to give very favourable consideration to those proposals that uh, Mr Dale Baker will be arguing before him tomorrow. Because unless those criteria are accepted, South Australian farmers, who are suffering equally with the, the farmers in other states from the devastating impact of drought this year, will be left high and dry. They will be left behind, contrary to the claim of, uh, of the Prime Minister uh, when he visited rural areas a couple of weeks ago, and, and the, uh, the, the, which he uh, reaffirmed yesterday in announcing this drought package. South Australian farmers will be left behind unless these very worthwhile criteria, which Dale Baker and his uh, officials from South Australia have worked hard to develop, as I say, in the face of years of neglect by the previous Labor government that was thrown out of office uh, at the end of last year. They have worked uh, very hard to develop those criteria. They are viable criteria, and I can only urge Senator Collins to accept them to ensure that South Australian farmers obtain this much-needed relief. Senator Carr. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the question I would like to... Oh, well, I'm sorry, sorry, Senator Carr. I must put the question first. The question is that the Senator take note of the Minister's answer. Those that opinion say aye, it's against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Carr. Mr Deputy President, I raise to take note of the answer given by Senator Schott concerning education in Victoria. It's a grave disappointment to me that the answer was uh, so misunderstood yeah. in this chamber by those opposite, and they've raised questions concerning private schools. The issues that were at the heart of this matter, in fact, were the effect on the state education system in Victoria. I don't think it is understood just how severe the changes to education have been in the state that I represent here. I don't think it is understood what sort of an impact that the cuts and uh, disruptions have occurred in Victoria are having on Commonwealth education programs. We have seen the last two years some 230 schools closed. 230 schools is a very, very large number. We have seen the teaching numbers reduced by about 8,000. 8,000 teachers are taken out of the education system in one state. We have seen a decline in the number of students attending school of some 7,000. We have seen cuts to the effect of $370 million. Now, all of that, of course, has a very dramatic impact on the quality of education outcomes in any school system. And as far as the Commonwealth is concerned, the prime objective of its educational support programs is to supplement state school funding and so as to provide the quality of opportunity for students right across Australia. The Commonwealth currently provides nearly $300 million for education in Victoria. My grave concern is that as we move increasingly to global budgets for individual schools at a state level, as we move towards greater devolution of education and authority in the states, we are likely to see the substitution of Commonwealth funds for state funds where their cuts are occurring. And this is a model that has an impact right across Australia. And it has an impact in terms of the quality of service that are available for the education of students right across Australia. And so, if we're 
The issue that arises in this question ultimately is whether or not state governments' attacks on education ultimately undermine the education objectives of a Commonwealth government. And that, to me, is a very, very important matter. And I think ultimately it would be seen as an extremely important matter for this whole country. We place increasing emphasis on Australian education and the development of skills necessary for a flexible and mature workforce. You can't have that while simultaneously undermining the very foundations of the education system in this country. And as I say, the importance of this matter is that the model that's being expressed in Victoria is one that's being copied now in South Australia, Western Australia and Tasmania. Now, the Commonwealth spends nearly $3 billion a year on schools programs. And of course, if this sort of pattern of behaviour is allowed to continue, where you will find the state governments undermining national programs, we are entitled to ask whether or not very large sums of money are being put at risk in terms of the outcomes, in terms of the service provided to the young people in this country. And ultimately, the sort of impact that such an attack on education has for the economy as a whole. And so for this reason, I'm very concerned. Now, Mr Kennedy in Victoria has indicated that the uh, basis of this report was, of course, uh, a device whereby there was uh, a high jump uh, bar established to make sure that uh, we go to each minister and each department and, uh, and the scenarios are put to them in such a way as that they remain focused on the overall objectives. I'm concerned, ultimately, whether or not uh, we're entitled to ask if this is the question of a high jump bar to keep ministers focused, how long before Mr Hayward, the Victorian Education Minister, in fact is up for the high jump himself? Well, the question is that the Senate take note of the minister's answer. Those that opinion say aye, it's against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGibbon. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move that the Senate takes note of the answer by Senator Evans to my question about Indonesia. The two points I want to make very briefly. The first is I find it very hard to believe that as conscientious and as diligent a minister as Senator Evans is, and I mean that quite sincerely in the discharge of his duty, hasn't visited the major embassies many times in this uh, capital city of Canberra. In fact, I'd have thought he'd have visited all embassies. But putting that aside, we have a grossly offensive sign uh, about East Timor that's been there across the road for quite a long while in front of the Indonesian embassy. And to argue that somehow or other the Indonesians have to put up with the most robust elements of Australian society and at the same time argue for the development of good Australian-Indonesian relations is to show that you nothing, know nothing at all about Indonesia. The sensitivity, the obliqueness of dealing with the Javanese, the dominant culture in Indonesia is as remote as possible from the barroom behaviour of, uh, in parts of Australia. It requires tact, it requires sensitivity and respect for their position. And this sign to them is grossly offensive. Furthermore, it does not reflect Australia's official foreign policy. Australia's foreign policy is to support the, uh, or recognise the incorporation of East Timor into Indonesia. But my main concern about it relates to the weaseling answer that the minister gave and somehow or other saying that, oh, this is a democracy, you've got to like it or lump it. Well, this isn't a libertarian society. It is no way. There, people don't have a licence to behave as they see fit. They certainly have a right to freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of speech. All of those things aren't transgressed, though, by good manners or denied by good manners. And what we've got here is a permanent insult. It's not a transient one, like a group meeting outside the gates of the embassy demonstrating a point of view. What we've got there is deeply offensive to the Indonesians, and it's deeply offensive to me as an Australian. Because we have emissaries in this country, the representatives of other powers, other nations, and we have an obligation on us to treat them courteously, not treat them discourteously the way we are treating the Indonesians at the present time, and have treated them for quite a long time. And I would ask the minister to really consider his position quite clearly. If he is sincere in his aim to develop better relations between Australia and Indonesia, the very first thing he will do is improve the manners of the host country and get rid of gratuitous insults like that East Timor sign. 
Or the question is that the Senator take Senator Kearney on the same matter. Your Honour, just, uh, I think the uh, point that uh, Senator McGibbon raises is a very important point, and many of the things that he says is uh, are true. But on the other hand, if we are in a uh, robust democratic society, through you, Mr. Deputy President, I ask uh, Senator McGibbon this: uh, Where are we to stop if we are uh, to stop people expressing views that we don't like, if we are to stop uh, people expressing views that we think, uh, and with good cause, in this case, that uh, our friends overseas might dislike, if we are to stop that, uh, where are we to get to? Uh, the fact of the matter is we are uh, one of the world's uh, most robust democracies. We are a true democracy. And once we start uh, stopping people uh, expressing themselves and saying what they want, then uh, uh, we're in trouble. And if we are a democracy, we can't uh, claim uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deny, or we can't move to deny, people from saying things that we don't like and, that the, and, and what other people might uh, not like. And uh, uh, the great statement that's quoted again and again, uh, I'll uh, might not like what you say, this is a paraphrasing of course, but I'll uh, give them a life to defend your right to say it. <laughs> if we forget that, uh, then we start uh, going backwards as a democracy. I uh, sympathise uh, very much with the sorts of things that uh, Senator McGibbon says, but on the other hand, uh, uh, if we go down the line that he is suggesting, then we start diminishing uh, those freedoms that we uh, so much cherish in this country. Order. The question is that the Senate take note of the Minister's answer. Those that have opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Order. Uh, in speaking on the 19th of September 1994 in relation to the determination of the President that a motion relating to a matter of privilege raised by Senator Vanstone should not have precedence, understanding Order 81, Senator Vanstone invited the President to reconsider his determination. He has uh, since done that, and I uh, incorporate it uh, in Hansard. Matters of public importance.